Well, this is uh, the information universe conference for those who are, have not been attending today. So this is the uh, public talk which we're giving. Uh, and uh, this is part of the conference. The conference has actually started uh, this afternoon. Uh, there's a, a series of extremely interesting talks from all different fields. It's really a crossing border conference. And this is also a crossing border theater. And so you public, you're very welcome here to cross your borders together with us. We're all in the middle of the crossing border move. So, um, um, and I will ask now Charlie Line, Line Weaver, who came all the way from Australia to attend this conference. <laughs> who in turn will introduce uh, Tamara Davis, who also performs, she also performs. So we are very honored to have them both here. And um, uh, so, so I, I hand it over to you, Tom. All right. Well, thank you very much. I was just to interview, not to but introduce Tamara, because I was her supervisor. 20 years ago, she came to the University of Wales while I was doing postdoc, and we started working on things together, mostly things that have to do with the Big Bang and we wrote a paper together called uh, Myth Common Misconceptions About the Big Bang. And I remember she took a draft of this paper and she showed it to Brian Schmidt. And then she came to me and said, Brian says we're nuts because we had criticized so many people in the appendix. We had quoted, quoted many, many people's popular science from papers. And we said, this is wrong because blah, 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 blah. this is wrong. So the point of this story is that if you have any questions about the Big Bang, and you're confused about it, this is the person you should ask because she has written a paper called Common Misconceptions About the Big Bang. You should also know that Tamara is an excellent ultimate Frisbee player. She was represented Australia for about a dozen years or so. She is a handler, and a handler is somebody who from the backfield distributes the Frisbee in clever ways. She's also a skier, and I guess half Canadian and half Australian, and uh, Anyway, an excellent cosmologist and just the kind of person you would want to give this type of talk and please enjoy the presentation, but also write down some questions because she is one of the best people to answer questions about the Big Bang. And take it away, Tamara. Thanks very much, Charlie. Uh, so hi everybody, it is an absolute pleasure to be here speaking under this amazing dome. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me along. Uh, it's fantastic to be giving public talks in person again after such a long time of talking to blank screens. Um, and yes, yeah, it was a really fun conference today so far, some really interesting talks. Um, but today, I'm, tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the dark side of the universe. Now, little did I know when I was a small child watching Star Wars and learning about the dark side of the Force that I would genuinely be studying the dark side of the Force um, as part of my PhD and other studies. Um, so I know that there are a lot of actual astrophysicists in the audience today as well, some of the uh, conference um, attendees. So I just wanted to take a census before we even begin. How many of you are professional astronomers? How many of you are members of the interested public? How many of you are something else? Ah, there's quite a few other, other uh, people. So conference attendees, for example, who are, um, who are others um, uh, who are not astrophysicists. Okay, so when I'm talking about the dark side of the universe, I'm talking about a couple, a few things that we know about, but we can't see. Um, so the two things in particular um, that I'm going to talk about are dark matter and dark energy. And they're two different things that have different effects. We know them by their gravitational effect, but they don't emit light, which is why we call them dark. And they are the, my massive summary of the two is that dark matter pulls, it comes around galaxies, it binds the galaxies together, to use a Star Wars frame, uh, phrase, uh, whereas dark energy pushes. It accelerates the entire expansion of the universe and pushes distant galaxies apart away from each other. Now, these two, two comp competing forces are enormously powerful uh, in our universe and, and dominate the energy budget of our universe. So how do we know about these things? Well, the, we know about them in part uh, because of the enormous power of modern day telescopes. Now, how many people have seen this image before? I mean, no hands up. Quite a few. I'm really glad. This is one of my favorite images of all time. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. 
um, is what you get when you take the whole telescope and you point it at a blank piece of sky, somewhere where you don't see stars, you don't see galaxies, there's basically nothing there. But you keep the shutter open for 11 days. Over that 11 day time scale, um, enough light lands on the detectors to reveal these just tiny little faint galaxies and um, a couple of stars that were just were always there, they were just simply too faint to see with our previous observations. And so in this image here, you see mostly galaxies, pretty much galaxies everywhere. There's a star down here and another star somewhere up here, which I can't see right now. Um, you can see them by their little crosshairs. But basically every single dot in here has hundreds of billions of stars in it. They're entire galaxies in their own right. Um, now, when, I, when I'm um, you know, out of the pub having a beer and meet some new people and I admit that I'm an astrophysicist, they're like, oh, well, that's, that's cool, uh, but, you know, uh, it's maybe impressive, but they're like, what do you, what do you actually do? Uh, they're like, do you, do you discover galaxies? Uh, and I'm like, well, discovering galaxies is actually really easy. You just take a telescope like this, you point it at a piece of sky that nobody's looked at for that long before, with that powerful telescope, and voila, you see more galaxies. It's really, it's like, it's, um, it's a breeze with the right equipment. Um, but with images like this, that statement is almost no longer true. Because when we look out at space with an image like this, we're looking back in time. So, you know, I'm looking at the people in the front row. I can see the light that arrives at me. It didn't arrive instantaneously. It took a short fraction of a second to get to me. People in the back row, it takes a slightly longer fraction of a second for the light to reach me from you. Um, it takes about eight minutes for light to get to me from the sun. It takes four years from the nearest um, star that's not our sun. It takes a couple of million years from the nearest galaxy. And when you're looking at galaxies like this, you're looking at light that's been traveling for billions of years. The most distant ones that you see here uh, have the light's been traveling for over 12 billion years. And if you put that in perspective, who knows how old the Earth is? Anyone yell it out if you know. Four and a half billion years. So you're looking here at light that's been traveling before the Earth formed. So th think about it. This, this light was emitted. It travels through space. And over here somewhere, there's a cloud of dust and gas that is collapsing. You know, a star ignites in the center of it. Planets form around it eventually. On one of those little planets, like there, there's oceans and things, little creatures form in the oceans. They crawl out of the oceans. They eventually learn to build telescopes. And the first, this light's been traveling this whole time. And the first thing that, that it hits in that entire um, 12 billion years is the mirror of our telescope. And, and the thing that is that we can detect that and understand what it is. And I found find that astonishing. Um, a lot of people ask me when I study this kind of thing, it's like, oh, you're studying the universe. Doesn't that make you feel small? And I'm like, well, I'm a small compared to a galaxy as I am compared to the, uh, a big compared to the nucleus of an atom, which so I figure that makes me about Goldilocks size. And um, when you can look out at stuff like this and not only see through the vast emptiness of space these very, very distant objects with the technology that we have these days, but actually see it and understand what it is. For example, that it's a black hole sucking in gas and, and yeah, making that gas really hot and that kind of thing. I feel that that, you know, that makes you make you feel powerful, not small. Um, and, and it also gives you a very, very distinct understanding of the preciousness of the atmosphere of the little earth that we sit in, that space can be that empty and light travel that far without hitting anything except the mirror of our telescope. So to give you a bit more of a visceral feeling of how far we're looking when we look at uh, images like this, here's a little bit of a zoom out from another image from the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah, this is just the Hubble Deep Field. Looks pretty cool from the dome. Uh, but as you zoom out and you zoom out, it's superimposed on images from other telescopes with wider fields of view. And as you continue to zoom out, it takes you quite a while, but eventually you get to the constellations that you might recognize. So it's a bit difficult with the resolution, but I hope that gives you like a bit of a visceral feeling of just how far you're looking when you're looking with these kinds of telescopes. Cool? I hope it's cool. <laughs> um, so why do we uh, go bother looking up? I think that's an important question to ask. Uh, and now, can anyone tell me 
what this picture is here on your right. Does anyone know what this is? Not the not the professional astrophysicist. Anyone from the public first? It's a neutrino detector. Excellent. This is Super Cameo Cardinal. It measures neutrinos, which are the one of the lightest particles in the in the standard model of particle physics. Um, and how it works is that this is actually gets filled with water, and these are all detectors that just detect light. And when it, these, these elusive neutrinos, they basically don't bash into anything. They, like you can have you know, whoosh, about a billion neutrinos just pass through you in that, in that second, I think. Um, but they mostly just pass through matter without even touching it. Uh, but occasionally they'll have like a direct hit on a nucleus, which sets off sort of like a shock wave that you, in light that you can see in, this, uh, in these photo detectors. So that's one way of sort of measuring sort of one of the fundamental particles of nature. This, this is also part of a really cool instrument. Does anyone know what this is part of? This is a higher degree of difficulty. Anyone, what was that? LIGO, yes. It's the um, gravitational wave detector. So this is able to measure ripples in space itself. Um, it's uh, exceptionally cool and was recently um, used to discover merging black holes and merging neutron stars, and it's a whole new way of understanding the universe, um, and it's a really exciting um, uh, piece of equipment. Um, oops. Uh, and then there's another one here. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's me. Does anyone know what, what that was is, what that place is? It's um, yeah. I, I was actually surprised at how readily excited I got to go down into the tunnels of, of CERN and actually see the the instruments. And so it's it's a twenty seven kilometer around ring where you accelerate particles to close to the speed of light. You bash them together, and from the shrapnel of those collisions, basically, you try and understand the nuts and bolts of what man is made of. Now, this one, hopefully, people know as well. It's made the news recently. What's this one? The James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and it's um, now launched, it's up at, um, at L2, and it's going to take some amazing pictures of the universe. And I'm putting these all up here because the reason I, one of the reasons I get excited about cosmology and um, astrophysics is because you can use it to measure fundamental physics, just like these other the neutrino detectors and the gravitational wave detectors and CERN. You're all trying to measure or understand the fundamental nature of the universe. And why would we bother looking up? Well, you know, even CERN, where, where you've got like arguably one of the biggest uh, experiments ever created by humans, um, it's still only, it, it's a, like it's a 27 kilometer around ring, but it's only a 27 kilometer around ring um, on a tiny little puny planet around a rather normal star. But we're in a universe where you have exploding stars, you have supernovae, you have black holes at the center of almost every galaxy, uh, sucking stuff in. You've got black holes colliding. You've got the Big Bang, and you've also just got time scales and length scales that you just can't possibly um, work with here on Earth. And so you can do experiments, or rather you can watch natural experiments going up on up in space that you can't do here on Earth. I mean, you don't want to collide two black holes in your backyard. That's a bad idea. So that's why we look up. Now, I'm going to explain these things that I mentioned before, the sort of dark side of the universe. And to start with, um, I'm going to just explain the discovery of the expansion of the universe. So oops, the, um, the discovery of the expansion of the universe required two things. Um, it requires you to measure the distance to distant galaxies, um, and you, it requires you to measure their velocity. Now, the first of those came from the discovery that Cepheid variables, this particular type of variable star, the period of their variation was um, correlated with how bright they were intrinsically. Now, this means they're a standard candle. Um, and that means that, uh, so a standard candle is basically, if you know how bright an object is intrinsically, you can tell how far away it is just by measuring how bright it appears. So it's literally as though I sort of came up to in front of you, held a candle in front of your face, and then ran down the street 100 meters and held the same candle up over there. You could tell approximately how far I was away because you know how bright candles tend to be. Now, that was how distances were measured. The next part was measuring the velocities. Uh, and so the, to do that, you, we take spectra. Um, and there should be a picture of a spectrum coming up now as well. Um, and the, the spectrum is the rainbow of light. 
So it's the, the colors of light. And uh, so oh, there's no there's no vision of the spectrum up there, but hopefully it'll come up soon. Um, the, spe the spectrum is basically, you've got the rainbow of light, and if something's moving away from you, then the colors are shifted towards the red. And if something's moving towards you, then the colors are shifted towards the blue. Uh, and so when you have, um, you may be familiar with this in the Doppler shift in sound, uh, which is the more familiar one. You may have heard like an ambulance siren go, yeah, 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 and then it goes as it goes away, or a racing car um, sound where the, it's high pitched as it comes towards you and low pitched as it goes away. So it's wow, uh, is a racing car sound like flying past you. Um, and those are the, the um, compression is like the blue shift shifting towards the blue side uh, coming towards you and shifting towards the red side going away. So it was discovered in the, uh, in the 1920s, um, it was discovered that we could do these uh, measurements. Um, and there was, that was uh, Henry Ernest von Leonard and Visto Sniffer who did some measurements on that. And then the actual, uh, th this is uh, the actual plot here that this guy is famous for. Uh, this guy's name is Hubble. Um, he's doing two things at a telescope that we never do these days. Uh, can anyone tell me what they are? smoking and looking through the eyepiece. Uh, we don't we uh, we take digital photos there's no way to walk down to the bottom of the telescope and look through it anymore um, but basically what you're seeing in this plot is a plot of the velocity as measured by the the colors and shifts in the spectrum and the distance as measured by the Cepheid variable stars and you can see that the more distant objects are moving away well, most of firstly you observe that almost everything's moving away from us <coughs> And then you see that the more distant ones are actually moving faster. And that's a really key point. And that was the discovery that, of the expansion of the universe. Cool. Now, that was in 1927 19, to 1929. Actually, Georges Lebaichler did it in 1927. Um, that was the first measurement of, of that. Um, the discovery of dark matter came hot on its heels. So how is that done? So this guy here, um, Fritz Zwicky, noticed that if you measure the, the motion of galaxies in clusters of galaxies, um, like this video should hopefully show, um, this is basically a modern day simulation, but it's basically showing um, cluster, galaxies falling in and growing into a big cluster of galaxies. What he noticed was that the motion of these galaxies was too fast for them to be held together by their own gravity. You could calculate how much gravity there should be in terms of the, um, the stars and things that you could see. And basically they were moving too fast. So he proposed that there was a bunch of dark matter there that we couldn't see that was contributing the extra gravity. Now, that's um, that was the first mention of dark matter. And you can see basically as soon as, I, I should have noted that, you know, there was a debate uh, early, just not, not too long before this expansion was discovered about the nature of these spiral things that people were seeing in the sky. They were called spiral nebulae. And people were debating whether those are clouds of gas in a spiral formation really close to us or whole galaxies far away. Uh, and it was, it was the measurement of distances that allowed you to figure out that that was the galaxies far away. And the expansion was discovered in the late 20s. Dark matter was first mentioned in the early 30s. So basically, as soon as we knew galaxies were galaxies, dark matter was blindingly obvious. There was something there that needed explaining. Um, exactly what it was, not sure. Uh, we'll get to that a bit more. Um, a real key observation in terms of the measurements of dark matter was made by Vera Rubin in the 60s. And rather than looking at the motion of gal big galaxies around each other in a cluster of galaxies, she was looking at the motion of galaxies uh, themselves, the rotation around their own axis. And what you expect, if you look at it, this picture of the galaxy here on the left, you've got lots of mass in the middle and not so much on the outskirts. Um, and so the, you expect that if you have lots of mass, something has to move really, really fast around it to avoid falling in because it's a, the, the force of gravity is really strong. But as you go further out, you don't have to move as quickly in order to, um, to not fall in because the gravity is not pulling you so strongly. Um, and so this is what you expect to see, that the velocity 
Um, initially, it goes up, but then it will go down towards the outskirts. The outskirts of the galaxy shouldn't need to rotate very fast in order to stay in orbit. On the other hand, this is what ended up we ended up seeing, and I don't know if we can go back and forwards again to start this video again. Um, but you, they, what we saw, uh, what they saw, was that the outskirts of the galaxy are actually moving really fast, and you get these flat rotation curves where the outskirts are moving as fast as the middle. And the explanation for that, the first explanation, is there's a lot more mass in there that we can't see, because that means that if it has to move fast in order to stay in orbit, then that means there must be a lot of mass pulling in. There must be a lot of gravity happening. So that was the, the discovery of dark matter. And I'll talk about whether that's actual um, mass or whether it's something else, like a different theory of gravity, a little bit later. Okay, so then that's the first dark thing. Now that's dark matter, it pulls. Now we want to talk about dark energy, which pushes. So the discovery, uh, basically ever since we knew that the universe was expanding, people were curious about whether it's going to expand forever or whether it's going to re-collapse. And what basically what that's asking is we know that even if galaxies are moving away from each other, they have gravity. They should be pulling on each other. So it should be slowing that expansion down. So it's the same as if I'm moving away from the Earth, when I jump, I'll, I go up, um, but the gravity of the Earth pulls me back down. Now, um, well, I have gravity as well. So we mutually pull each other towards each other. Now, if I was to go to the gym a lot, uh, build up my leg muscles, and jump off the Earth at a uh, speed of 11 kilometers per second, okay, I'd have to go to the gym quite a bit, but um, you know, and in the absence of a ceiling and air resistance, which would be very messy, um, in the absence of a ceiling and air resistance, I would get off the Earth and I would never come back. So 11 kilometers per second is the speed you would need to go. It's the escape velocity to escape Earth's gravity. You would keep slowing down as you went up, but you would get to an infinite distance before you stopped and fell back down. So you don't fall back down if you go more than 11 kilometers per second. So the question was, do the galaxies have the escape velocity from each other? Are they moving fast enough to escape their mutual gravitational attraction? So that's met, sort of shown here. We know how fast the universe is going right now. So is it slowing down to this enough that it's going to collapse? Is it going to expand forever? Still decelerating, but expand forever. Um, or is it going to be like the perfect balance between these two, where it, where it would be like having exactly 11 kilometers per second where you reach infinity and stop, but never actually reflex? So that was the question. But it's a much harder question to answer because uh, you had to see further away. And so that actually needed to wait until we had a better standard candle than those Cephe variables to discover with confidence. And so here you have just a uh, sort of animation of a supernova going off. Um, the, in the 1990s, it was discovered that there's this particular type of supernova, an exploding star, that always explodes to approximately the same brightness. So again, just by measuring how bright they appear, you can tell how far they are away. The thing with supernovae, though, is during the explosion, the single star exploding can outshine the billions of stars from the rest of the galaxy. This is really useful because it means as long as you can see galaxies, you can see supernovae. So you can see these much, much further away than you could measure the Cepheid variables. Um, so now we have a distance indicator that we can use um, for a long distance away. And essentially, if you think about it, if, as I said before, when you look far away, you're looking back in time when you're looking at the universe. So you measure the distance, which gives you sort of um, how far they are away, obviously. Um, and then you measure its velocity using the redshift. Uh, and you're essentially measuring, you're able to compare how fast the universe was expanding in the past compared to how fast it's expanding now. In detail, you measure the, the magnitude of the supernova versus its redshift um, and plot that versus theory, but that's essentially what you're doing. You're comparing the speed of the universe in the past to the speed of the expansion now. Uh, and much to everybody's surprise, well, much to many people's surprise, um, there, there were some interesting discoveries here. So, but first, but before I get to that, um, I thought I would show these guys. Um, so this is on the left, Brian Schmidt, um, so in the 1990s, two teams um, got, uh, independently went out to try and make this measurement with supernovae. 
Brian Schmitz on the left, he was leader of the high redshift supernova team. So Paul Moody's on the right, he's leader of the supernova cosmology project. And they're, here they are, they're pretending to fight at a conference. They were, at, you know, it was a friendly competition. Um, <laughs> so I, how do you discover supernovae? How do you go about doing this? Well, I actually joined the, the teams of both of these. I had both of these guys as my boss in um, 2004. Uh, and I was helping look at the, um, the trying to discover new supernovae. Um, and this was with the Blanco telescope, which is a four meter optical telescope in Chile. Uh, and you can see the very pretty Magellanic clouds in the, in the corners and stuff like that. Um, now, what we did was to, in order to observe supernovae, all you have to do is sort of simple in principle. You just look at the same patch of sky night after night and see if anything changes. If there's a bright thing there that wasn't there yesterday, maybe that's a supernova. Now, if you look, this is an example of one image we took back at that time. Uh, and we observed um, a couple of dozen of these per night. And a supernova will, on average, go off in a galaxy about once every 400 years. Um, and so that means in order to observe one supernova a year, you'd have to observe, monitor 400 galaxies per year. Now, we wanted to observe way more supernovae than that. So that means that these big galaxies in the front, they're not that interesting to us because the statistical likelihood that there's a supernova going to go off in the, sort of the few dozen galaxies that are big and close to us is very small. But there's lots of tiny little galaxies in the background here. Um, and there's much more likelihood that we're going to see a supernova in one of those. So um, if you zoom in on a little patch of this, uh, yeah, sort of about that big, and go on to the next one, I've got this slide sort of that says why this is hard. Um, because here on the left is the before image. It does not have a supernova in it. Here on the right is the after image. It does have a supernova in it. Can anybody see the supernova? Oh, I've got a few people saying yes over here that very confidently. Um, can you describe it, actually? I've got, a, I've got a laser pointer that you can help me with. Yeah, so the top button here. Oh, nice work, yeah. Does other people see that one? So it's here at this fuzzy galaxy at the top, there's a little dot at the bottom of it. That's the, that's the galaxy or the supernova rather. Um, that's well done. Usually it takes people longer to find this when I do this in public talks. Because there's a few other things, like you might notice this one here is also a dot that doesn't exist in this image. Uh, and that, that's a cosmic ray hit. Uh, and you'll also notice there's a few things on this side that don't appear in this one. That's just because this was a better, um, had better conditions um, and was a longer exposure than this image. So in order to be able to discover supernovae, you have to be able to disentangle all of these things. And this little one here is actually a blindingly obvious nearby supernova. So it gets really, really tricky to discover these when the supernova is the same size as the um, as the galaxy, like you, when the galaxy is so small that you can't differentiate the sort of fuzzy blob of the galaxy with the dot beside it. Cool. Um, so lo and behold, what they discovered um, after making these measurements in the 90s was both teams independently found that none of these are true, that the expansion of the universe is actually speeding up. Uh, and in detail, we know that it actually slowed down a little bit first um, here before it started speeding up. I may have fixed that on the image as well, um, but maybe not. Yeah, so it actually decelerated a bit first and then started to accelerate. So that's this was the discovery of the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. And that's as weird as if I was just standing on here, I gently jumped off, off the ground and I accelerated off into space. Something is causing gravity to act repulsively instead of attractively. We don't know what it is, but we give it the name dark energy. So that was the discovery of dark matter and dark energy. Now, dark energy was accepted very quickly after its discovery. Um, and that was uh, partially because it, it landed on fertile ground. I said it was surprising to find out that the universe was accelerating, but there was already a lot of people who thought that it might be. And that was because there was a couple of problems with cosmology in, in the 1990s. So firstly, the age of the universe didn't match up. People who studied stars were like, you know, the oldest stars are close to 14 billion years old. 
the people who studied the expansion of the universe was like, well, at this rate, it's uh, approximately nine and a half billion years old. So that meant the stars were older than the galaxies that they lived in. And some people thought that was a problem. Secondly, the number of galaxies seemed wrong. People were doing counts of how many galaxies there were in like a volume of space nearby and comparing that to how many galaxies were in a volume of space far away. And so you get, get the galaxy density, the number of galaxies divided by the volume. And there just seemed to be too many galaxies at high redshift. And people were like, meh, uh, you know, maybe that's because the, um, you just don't understand galaxy evolution, galaxies merge more than you think. Uh, and it wasn't really fully believed, although as we'll come to in a second, they, they had some pretty good explanations. And the third one is that the mass of the universe, or the energy of the universe, didn't add up. Um, and that was because people who measured like, the, how much mass there was in galaxies and things said that there was about 30% of the mass needed to make the universe flat. Now, there was good theoretical reasons to expect that it should be flat. Um, and I won't go into flatness in great detail because it'll take a little bit of time, but it simply is just the geometry of space was such that triangles should add up to have angles of 180 degrees. But, um, but there was this disparity. The 70% of the universe seemed to be missing. Uh, and so there was arguments about that too. So the solution uh, to all of these things uh, was acceleration. So in the first case, if you look, this is just a plot of the relative size of the universe versus time. And it's normalized so that at the present day, the slope is approximately the slope of um, how fast we know the universe is expanding right now. And you can see that if it decelerated, so if it were going fast and then slowed down to this point, then its age from going back in time to when it hits zero size is um, about nine and a half billion years. Whereas if it accelerates to this point, then it's much older. And I've just done this in a couple of generic universes, but this one's approximately ours and this one's approximately what was there before. Um, and so you can see this solved the problem with the age of the universe. And people were like, oh, stars are younger than the universe. Phew, that works. That's right. Secondly, the number density, people hadn't counted the number of galaxies incorrectly. They'd been divided by the wrong volume. Because if you add acceleration to the expansion of the universe, the volume of space at, at bigger distances was bigger than what people had calculated. And that's why there was more galaxies there. So that solved that problem. And people had actually predicted in the early 90s, there are papers that say that, say that um, 80% of the universe should be in um, at the form of dark energy. And so that was already um, a, a measurement that had been made before the supernovae ever came along. And finally, there, when you figure out how much dark energy you need in order to uh, make, uh, to fit the acceleration you see, it needed to be about 70% of the universe, which is where that 70% of the energy that I said was missing um, was. And so that made everybody happy. The universe was flat uh, and, um, well, probably not everybody happy, but it made a lot of people happy that these all, all now added up. So that was pro probably one of the reasons that the weird idea that gravity could act repulsively, that there's something out there called dark energy that, that's accelerating the expansion of the universe, um, why that was accepted so quickly. And voila, that's why these guys um, got the Nobel Prize um, for physics in 2011. And you'll notice this is Brian Schmidt and Saul Perlmutter looking a bit more respectable than they were when they were pretending to have a, a fisticuffs fight at the conference a bit earlier. <coughs> okay, so, what could this um, dark matter and dark energy be? Now, I've been talking about as though they're sort of a physical thing, but really we use them just to, as names for something that we don't understand. Now, starting with dark matter, there's chance that it's a new type of particle, much like the neutrino that I was talking about that passes through the Earth and barely touches anything. Maybe it's a type of particle that just doesn't interact like the normal particles that, that we know and love. Um, and it only we can only notice it by its gravitational effect. <laughs> Maybe it's a bunch of black holes. That was a theory that was quite popular early on, but it looks like that's less likely to be true now. Um, or maybe it's a modification to our theory of gravity. So maybe we have, you know, we've got a theory of, we, we had Newton's theory of gravity. Um, it was it's still great if you're building skyscrapers and stadiums, but it fails if you want to explain the GPS and the orbits of some of satellites and the um, orbits of Mercury and stuff like that. Um, 
Uh, and then we had Einstein's theory, which does explain those things better. That's general relativity. But maybe we haven't got the final theory of gravity. And indeed, we know that at the moment we've got quantum physics and general relativity. Quantum explains like particles and school stuff. General relativity explains gravity. Um, and they, the two theories don't work. They're fundamentally incompatible. Like, I mean, they work amazingly well in their own spheres, but we don't know yet how to put them together in a nice, neat way. And one of the really cool things about this conference is some of the ideas and theories that are, are being proposed to try and do that better and to try and explain um, both dark matter and dark energy in ways that modify gravity. Now, I think the the... I would say that the leading candidate from astrophysicists is that there's a new type of particle that it explains dark matter, but um, particularly modified gravity and the new type of particle are uh, still viable options. Dark energy, on the other hand, um, could, again, it could be a modification to our theory of gravity. Um, it could be something called the energy of the vacuum. Uh, and this is something that's predicted from quantum physics, that if you take empty space, you take out all the matter, you take out the light, there's nothing left there then you get um, virtual particles popping in and out of existence. This is like, you can't actually have completely empty space. It's related to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, if you've heard of that. Um, and basically this stuff has the correct sort of properties that would accelerate the universe, but there's also sort of a naive prediction that you can make about how much of this stuff there should be out there. And quantum physics predicts that it should be something like 120 orders of magnitude more than we observe. Now, when you're looking at the history of bad predictions, that's really ranking way up there as one of the worst predictions that's not in infinity. Um, now, it is a bit of a hand wavy prediction. There might be reasons why it doesn't have that value. But that's why uh, people just um, haven't just gone, oh, dark energy is vacuum energy, we can stop looking. Um, we're now trying to measure its um, properties much more precisely. Okay, so I've taken a little bit of time here. Um, so I'm gonna race through um, a few other observations in like five minutes. So this is gonna be a whirlwind tour because those two measurement, basic measurements that I was just talking about um, are only the discovery. Since the, we used rotation curves of galaxies and supernovae to measure the acceleration of the universe, <clears throat> um, we have learnt um, a lot more. Now, um, if I said before that, you know, this, well, I think I actually forgot to say, this, Im this image here, I was saying that, um, you know, it, used, it, it was easy to, easy to discover galaxies. Um, with the, this image, this is, you just have to expose your telescope for longer in that patch. With this image, it's almost no longer true because you're looking so far back in time that you're looking back to the era before galaxies had even existed, before galaxies formed. Um, but if you look back even further, you see um, this, which is the cosmic microwave background. It's an image from the Planck Space Telescope. And basically this is a radiation all around us that's coming from all directions, just light from coming from all directions. Um, and it's the leftover afterglow from the Big Bang. What you're essentially looking at here is the time when the whole universe was as hot as the uh, interior of a star, or the surface of a star. Um, so if you were living back just before this era, it would have been like living inside a star, but a star that extended everywhere in every direction that you could possibly go. So it was enormously hot, enormously dense. So I make a comparison to our sun um, and the, whoop, that's a, a big one. That's, a, that's our sun stretched out um, and it is hot and cold spots uh, or like um, effect, the effect of, you see the effect of sound waves and things in our sun there. Um, uh, but there's fluctuations. And basically, when you look at the surface of the sun, what you're seeing is just the light that's coming from the very, very surface. Um, inside that, it's opaque. And when you're looking back at the early times of the universe, you're looking at um, a, an era where the, the light couldn't really travel very freely. These days, as I was talking about, it's very empty, light can travel for a long way. Back then, light couldn't really, couldn't really travel. It kept hitting particles. Um, and it was only after the universe expanded enough to become sort of transparent that light could propagate forwards and it's been traveling ever since. And that's the that's basically what we're seeing with this cosmic microwave background. Now, um, I'll skip forward to this one, or this is jump, jump forward a couple to where we see a plot. 
Um, so here, this is a plot of the strength of fluctuations. So these are hot and cold spots that you see as the red and blue dots in this pattern. Um, are, we're predicted to have a particular um, type of sort of pattern, a particular sort of typical scale that you would see these blobs at. Um, and so I'm not going to explain this in detail, except to say that there's a certain strength of fluctuations you expect as a function of the separation, like how far between the dots. Um, and this red curve is basically what you would expect to see if you had the amount of dark matter that you had in, that we measured through rotating galaxies and the amount of dark energy that was measured from supernovae. Um, and the blue dots are the data. Now, this plot here is if I take, leave everything else the same and remove the dark energy from that model, then that's what you would expect, that's what you would predict to see. And again, if I kept everything else the same and just removed the dark matter from the model, it would be an even worse fit to the data. Now you can twist around, you can tune things to make things a bit, a bit better with dark matter and dark energy excluded. But basically this is showing you how sensitive this cosmic microwave background is to the proportion, or to what the universe is made of, to the dark energy and dark matter and stuff. Uh, and so that's, um, you can see this is just an absolutely stunning, I think when they had a press release and they showed this plot, I think I literally gasped as I saw it. Oh, wow, it's so amazing because it was um, such a beautiful match of theory and data. So um, it's just a phenomenal test and confirms the amount of dark matter and amount of dark energy that we thought were out there, um, but with more precision. Now, where are the, these patterns coming from? I wanted to give you a quick description of that. Um, and they're coming from that early universe, part of the patterns at least, is coming from that early universe where you had um, sound waves propagating at more than half the speed of light. Oh, this is huge, this is awesome. Okay, so if you have this like fluctuation starting out in the middle and you put pay that forwards, it's gonna propagate out as a sound wave. Um, but as the universe expands, it gets to a point when that cosmic microwave background is emitted that the sound waves get frozen in. There's a point at which the, the, the particles are so, so far away from each other that they can't bounce off each other anymore. And that sound wave that gets frozen in has a typical length, a typical distance, like a typical distance that sound could travel from the beginning of the universe until when it gets frozen and sound can't travel anymore. Um, and that, sound waves are just compression waves, right? They're over densities and under densities. And if you just set up the initial conditions of the universe, so you've got some over densities, like some clumps of things separated by some sort of slightly more empty patches, what's gonna happen? Gravity is gonna do its work, it's going to, matter is going to fall towards itself in the dense patches, and that's where galaxies are going to fall. So that's um, uh, the, this pattern that we, what that means in total is that the distribution of galaxies that we see in the universe is not random. And there's an actual characteristic length scale in the separation of galaxies that was laid down close to the Big Bang by these sound waves that were propagating in the early universe. And amazingly, we can now measure this. Um, and so I was involved in a survey called Wiggles that measured this. There's a, a bunch of other things, the Slow Digital Sky Survey, et cetera. Um, the Dark Energy Survey is now measuring it and DESI is about to measure it. And this peak here is what we're trying to find, the, a sort of a characteristic separation between galaxies um, that we can then use as a standard rule. Because this distance we know, and by measuring this dis distribution of galaxies and finding this ruler, we can use it like a standard candle. It's a known separation. And so it's like laying grid paper down over the universe. If we measure this BAO scale at all different places and different distances, we can measure how much the universe has expanded using standard rulers instead of standard candles. And these baryon acoustic oscillations have also beautifully confirmed what was seen with the dark energy and dark matter um, from the other probes. Okay, so I think I better leave some time for questions. So I'll stop, but I can't resist showing you um, a few other animations of just how we measure these things like the baryon acoustic oscillations. Uh, and that's because, so here, this is like, uh, this is actual data um, where, oh, it went away, where imagine we're at the center uh, of this and every dot here is a galaxy. And this is the distribution of uh, galaxies that we can that we can see around us. There's gaps in it from parts of the sky that we haven't seen yet, um, but you can see this sort of beautiful web of structure 
um, of, of, in the distribution of galaxies. And there's a bunch of different um, videos showing this at different scales um, for a variety of different surveys. Um, so we yeah, have time, we can possibly jump to the one with a few different um, surveys on it. But this is basically how we measure those baryon acoustic oscillation scales. And I have to thank um, Sam Hinton, my, um, one of my PhD students, for making these beautiful plots of a bunch of the data. Uh, it looks very cool. Um, okay, I was also going to talk about gravitational lensing, which confirms this um, beautifully as well. But I think I've run out of time, so I think I'd better ask, stop and ask for questions. If any, anyone wants to, they can ask me about gravitational lensing. Um, but otherwise, I'll just leave you with this up on the, the screen. I hope that what I've managed to convince you of a little bit is that there's these weird, that we've seen some weird things. There's some there's dark matter and dark energy out there. Who We have a lot of evidence now from a variety of different directions that say that they're out there, um, but we don't yet know what they are. And I have sometimes, I like finishing with a nice calming picture of a tree um, because they are the, um, I, I have an analogy that I like to make, which is if you think back 200 years, uh, but if you look at the leaves of trees blowing around in the wind, you can't see the wind, right? And 200 years ago, we did not know what the wind was made of. We didn't have a particle theory of matter. We didn't have the periodic table. We didn't know what carbon and oxygen and nitrogen were in the way that we do today. <clears throat> Similarly today, we can see the motion of galaxies. We can see them blowing around in the, in the wind of dark matter and dark energy. We can infer a lot of their properties of dark matter, of, of what's pushing them, but we don't know what they are. Um, who knows what we're going to be able to do once we figure out uh, what dark matter and dark energy are and whether we can harness them or uh, understand the fundamentals of physics a little bit more once we understand what they are. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, I managed to leave a little bit of time for questions if there's any questions out there. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so the question was, um, what about black holes? Um, I said that they're probably not a candidate for dark matter, but um, does that include primordial black holes and why am I discounting them? Now, I'm not discounting them completely, they, and they're definitely still contributing to dark matter. Um, but, and one of the best observational constraints for black holes um, and primordial black holes is that um, I didn't get I didn't get to lensing, but gra ben, um, gravity bends the path of light, and so if there's a black hole and there's a star or something behind it, the light from the star that was moving out sideways gets magnified and bent around the black hole, and we would see that as a magnification of the background star. So if there were lots of tiny little black holes floating around our galaxy and moving around. They would sometimes pass between us and the other stars in the galaxy. And when that happens, the star would uh, briefly brighten and then fade again. So we can put upper limits on how many black holes are out there by how much we see this happening. And the upper limits are quite strict. We can't have enough black holes out there to explain um, the amount of dark matter that we see given these limits. With some mass, with some mass, uh, there are some um, windows. I'm going to say because I, I was going to continue on this because there is, it is possible to squeeze those into some of the windows uh, of, the, of the probability space. But it's getting harder and harder to do that. And were you going to say something on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is so what I uh, what just said is that if they are clustered. Um, and they're not uniformly distributed, then it is possible that we will have missed them in these observations, and they can possibly still make up 100% of the, the dark matter. Um, and so, yes, so that's why I was like, I'm not just counting them completely. There are ways that they can fit, fit in, but they, they, get it, they, were, they were much more popular in the past because it was much easier to fit them in before we had the constraints that are as tight as they are now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, true. I'm less familiar with the constraint. So this is like how small can the black holes be? Um, there's, I think, there's constraints from CMB, etc., on the pro on the amount of pro um, they they we would see um, essentially the Hawking radiation and stuff. All that the, um, if they would have an effect on the CMB. So 
there are constraints on that end as well, but um, I'm less familiar with those. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm like friends coming your way. Uh, I don't know a lot about the topic, but uh, I thought that energy should not have mass, but the picture showed that 70% of the universe mass consisted of dark energy. How does that work? Great question. So I sort of slightly interchangeably asked, uh, use the word energy and mass there. Um, Einstein had this famous equation, E equals mc squared which showed that if you have a certain amount of mass, it's equivalent to a certain amount of energy. And uh, if you have a certain amount of energy, it's equivalent to a certain amount of mass. And the C is the speed of light. It's related by the speed of light squared. Um, and so all energy gravitates. And so when we're talking about that um, energy budget or mass budget of the universe, I was using the sort of energy mass equivalence in E equals MC squared, essentially. So you can, um, it's balanced that way. Does that make sense? Not at all. <laughs> Um, yeah, so if I, another way that I could say something like this um, is that if I have a cold cup of coffee and a hot cup of coffee, the hot cup of coffee has more energy. So it would actually gravitate more strongly than the cold cup of coffee. So both mass and energy have a gravitational attraction effect. And so even though you don't, even if you have a massless particle like a photon, the um, particle of light, it doesn't have any mass, but it does have energy and therefore it will still gravitate. <laughs> yes, so this kind of energy pushes rather than pulls. And um, if I do it, I, I'm nervous to do this description in, to, in front of uh, professional astrophysicists because I know I'm gonna do a very hand wavy description here. Um, but um, it said the, what the property that we think is needed there is it has a negative pressure. And one of the really funky things about pressure in the universe usually is that pressure occurs when particles are moving and they bounce off each other. That means these particles have energy, they have kinetic energy, they're moving. And because they are moving and they have um, this po positive energy, um, they, uh, they gravitate more strongly. So if you have something out there with pressure uh, compared to something where the atoms are just sitting still, the thing with pressure is the thing that has more energy, things are moving, and it actually gravitates more strongly. So pressure in the universe usually pulls instead of pushes, which is weird because we usually think of pressure as something that is able to push out. Like you've got pressure in a piston and it pushes the piston out. Um, it doesn't usually pull things in. But that only occurs when you have a, a differential. So you've got high pressure over here and low pressure over there, and that means work can be done by the piston. When you have a uniform distribution everywhere, that pressure can't do any work that way. And the only effect it has is gravity, it pulls in. Now, when, with the vacuum energy, the leading candidate I said for dark energy, it would have negative pressure. And that means it has the opposite effect to the positive pressure that gravitates. Negative pressure would anti-gravitate. Uh, and so that's my attempt at explaining that. Uh, the very, very weird property um, of the vacuum energy. <laughs> I got it. Hmm, maybe. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Uh, I think about the time. Yes, my question is: How was dark matter and uh, dark energy before the Big Bang? Oh, where, where's the question? Oh, okay. Yes. Um. Well, was there anything before the Big Bang? Good question. We we don't we does we actually don't have an answer to that. So there are lots of ideas of how the Big Bang could have begun. And it could have happened that there was like just empty space. Uh, it was just vacuum. So there was some like pre-existing vacuum from which something, uh, there was a quantum fluctuation or something which caused acceleration, which became real. There was, um, there's uh, ideas of how that could have happened. But really when we can, we're talking about um, cosmology, we can trace ourselves back to a tiny fraction of a second after the big bang, after T equals zero. But we really don't know what was happening in that very, very early fraction of a second, and we certainly don't know if there was anything existing before that. So I think if people are, there's a lot of speculation, a lot of ideas, a lot of theories, but I don't think anyone can say definitively what's, what was happening back there. That's one of our jobs as astrophysicists or cosmologists now to try and answer that kind of question. Looks not.
So, right. yeah, thank you very much. That's enough. That's enough. Thank you very much.